I would like to welcome everyone to the final Balanced Living Lecture Series of 2013. We are currently in the planning stages for 2014 and we have February as a tentative time period for our next lecture, so everyone knows. And I think we're planning to do that one on sleep because um, none of us get enough. Uh, <laughs> The um, Balanced Living Lecture Series is brought to you by the Cincinnati Bar Association's Health and Wellbeing Committee, which was actually founded in January of 2012 to address issues of attorney health and well-being, including mental health and stress management. This series uh, was pretty much the brainchild of Dimity and our, the rest of our committee, some of which are here today. Bob is here today. I don't see anyone else. Wow. So um, hopefully some others will filter in. Uh, today's lecture um, is brought to you by a grant from the Cincinnati Bar Foundation, specifically the Ken Jamison Health and Wellbeing Fund, which was started by his um, family um, to raise awareness of depression and suicide within the legal community. So today's lecture is on mindfulness. And um, I'm really glad to see everyone here because this is a topic that I have personally experienced the benefits from. And our speaker today is uh, Dr. Richard Sears, who is on our advisory panel and was someone I had lunch with in December of 2011 and who helped us get um, some ideas flowing for how to uh, start a health and well-being committee um, here at the Bar Association. He's a licensed psychologist and a faculty member at Union Institute University. He's a clinical research faculty member at UC's Center for Integrative Health and Wellness. He conducts uh, at least two mindfulness seminars here in the Cincinnati area. One is in Montgomery, which will be starting in January 15th, right? Uh, it's some, in mid-January. Like yeah. And a, another one is at the UC Center in Westchester. Um, I personally hope to uh, attend the one in uh, Montgomery, and I might just give it as Christmas gifts to people who I think need it, so we'll see. Um, he's the author of Consultation Skills for Mental Health Professionals and Mindfulness in Clinical Practice, and his website is also listed in the materials as psych-insights.com. Um, I would like for you guys to join me in welcoming Mr. Sears. All right. All right, well, thank you. Normally, I, I much prefer more of a discussion format, but given the short amount of time we have and uh, the fact that we're recording this, I think we'll save more time toward the end for questions. And uh, uh, believe it or not, I really enjoy the, the hard, challenging, so what kinds of questions, because I've certainly heard them all in my clinical work and organizational work, et cetera. So uh, unless you just have a burning question that's going to get in the way of moving forward, uh, we'll, we'll save those toward the end. Um, so mindfulness, stress reduction, I'm guessing everybody in here is no stranger to stress. How many of you have heard of mindfulness before, at least a little bit? Um, anybody actually practice and maybe know a little bit about that? Okay. So most, for most of you, I can say whatever I want, and you kind of have to believe me, right? <laughs> um, actually, what you're going to find, mindfulness is a very natural process. You're all doing it already, but what we can do is help foster that as a more reliable, useful, useful consistent kind of a skill. So before we do that, let's talk about stress. Again, I'm sure uh, most of you here are no strangers to stress, but one of the things I want to point out is the fact that uh, on this curve, most of us think of the far right down here, where when stress gets really high, our performance gets low, right? And you've all had that experience, we call it, well, hopefully you all haven't had the experience of burnout, but that's what it could lead to, right? Where you're, you're working harder and harder and harder, but finding that you're getting less and less and less actually done. Um, but few of us think about the fact that this other side is not the goal either on the left, where there's no stress in your life, you actually wouldn't have any motivation for performance. There'd be no reason to really get up and, and try something difficult or accomplish something big. Um, now, maybe a lot of you are thinking, well, I'd, I'd like to see what that's like to have no stress in my life and see how that works out. But, uh, but I think it's important. We're not talking about completely getting rid of stress. We're talking about finding a balance and making it um, useful. So the stress res response, again, I'm sure um, many of you are experiencing this all day long, uh, but what's important about the stress response is it's actually a good thing. It's useful 
Um, it just wasn't designed to be done long term. So, uh, in fact, I'm told if you just started running, just running, after about 30 seconds, if you didn't have a, a stress response, your body would just fall over dead because your muscles need that flow of oxygen. It needs the heart to pump harder. It needs that higher blood pressure to get uh, the red blood cells out to all the different cells in your body. So the response itself is good. It was just meant for a short term response. So if I see a tiger and I start running, um, I don't have to worry about reproducing in that moment. I don't have to worry about uh, digesting in that moment, right? Um, I need more blood flow to my muscles um, so I can run faster. I need that heart uh, to pump faster. The problem, of course, is that uh, over the long term, when that's going on all day long, now my muscles are tight, they're sore, um, I have digestive problems, um, I have heart problems, all these different things that were meant to be a short-term response when they're going over and over again. So the problem here is that um, our minds are responding to stress as if there was a real physical threat here when our thoughts are able to do that for us now. So, you know, if there was a tiger at one of these doors, um, all of us, unless you're just some kind of cold-blooded tiger killer, um, would feel something to see this tiger, right? And want to run away or at least put somebody else between you and the tiger or whatever you're going to do. Um, so that response kicks in so we can survive. Now, the problem is we have all these tigers of the mind, right? Oh, boy, that, that report was due. I've got this case coming up. I'm late for this appointment. I'm biting through traffic. Every time you have one of those thoughts, at a, at a much smaller level, but still happening, that stress response, cortisol is washing over your brain, adrenaline, these kinds of things, and it's causing this reaction in its attempt to help you. But when it's going all day long, you don't have that counter response. <sighs> so after you're done running from the tiger on the savanna, you just fall down in the grass, right? Oh, boy, I lived, I survived. The tiger got tired after a little bit, right? So your body has that chance to recover. You appreciate all the friends around you. I love you, man, because you survived this tiger attack. Your body gets that chance. But all day long, we've got texts, phone calls, all these things going on. You never get that counter that we call the parasympathetic response to kick in. So uh, because of this chronic nature of all these stress responses, they say up to 90% of doctor's visits at least have some stress component to them in terms of interfering with your body's ability to heal or making you more vulnerable. And I do think it's important to emphasize stress doesn't cause a disease just because you're stressed doesn't mean the bubonic plague is going to find its way into you. What it does though is it makes you more vulnerable to disease and it um, makes it, it makes whatever condition you might have worse because it's interfering with your body's ability to heal itself. So. Um, probably all know that already, but I think it's good to emphasize what this is that we're looking at to begin with and why mindfulness uh, can uh, make a difference with this. So mindfulness is a common word in the English language. It's actually present in all kinds of cultures. It's something we're all born with, but when we um, practice it in a conscious way, uh, we can start to shift how we relate to our stress. So this is John Kabat-Zinn. I don't know if you've any, any of you have uh, any of his books, or uh, saw the Bill Meyer special with him, but um, he's one of the ones that systematized this approach back in the 70s and was able to measure this scientifically and got the ball rolling and why um, so many of the scientific communities are really uh, catching on to this and really um, getting involved in the research because it uh, has been uh, put through our gold standard of research, randomized clinical trials. So you try mindfulness, you try something else. Let's see if there's a difference in how you respond to all these conditions, et cetera. Um, so he defines mindfulness. This is a rich definition. Uh, so let me walk through it, and then we'll take it apart a little bit here. The awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, to the unfolding of experience from moment to moment. Okay. So really, if, if you had to narrow it down to just a small bit, it's, it's about paying attention. Now, why would paying attention make that much of a difference? Let's break this down. The awareness that emerges is um, when you sort of wake up from what you're doing, so to speak, because a lot of times we get put into this automatic pilot kind of a mode. Um, have you ever had this happen where you're just driving down the road and suddenly you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> Right? Or maybe you just ended up at your house, 
Or maybe you ended up somewhere else and you meant to go somewhere because your body just kind of automatically took you there. Um, now, automatic pilot's not a bad thing, right? If every time you got in the car, okay, do I push this pedal to go or this pedal, right? It's good to have these automatic pieces. What happens, though, is we get um, stuck in that too much and our whole life kind of goes by on automatic pilot. Or it gets us into trouble or it takes us places we didn't mean to go. Uh, I was taking a friend home once and we got in this deep conversation. And, you know, it's not like you're unsafe. You still stop at stoplights and pay attention to the traffic, but somehow you're not noticing where you're going. Um, so I ended up at my own house, even though I was supposed to take this friend home. And, you know, that's not a big deal. But what happens when you have automatic ways of reacting to stress or to emotion? Maybe you get upset in the way you express something or you hear something and you automatically think they're attacking you. So you say something back and now you look like the one that's out of control with your anger, even though they may have sparked you with something. Um, I, I had a friend once walking by uh, and I said, uh, at the office, and I said, hey, great job on that work you did the other day. And he's just, he just stopped and looked at me. What do you mean by that? I said, that project that you did yesterday, I thought you did an excellent job on it. What are you saying? And it, it, this, didn't, this wasn't like him. This was, this was strange. Um, and what I figured out was happening was he was in the middle of a divorce. And so he was so used to whatever somebody says to me is going to be sarcastic. He thought I was being sarcastic. Hey, good job on that thing you did yesterday. And so he responded defensively. Now, can you imagine if I didn't catch that, I would have said, well, you know, heck with you. I'm just trying to give you a compliment. And then our friendship dissolves over a complete misunderstanding and automatic reaction. Um, and now, of course, it's easier for me to see his automatic reaction than to catch my own, right? But this is what this is about, is that waking up out of automatic pilot of just deciding, oh, you know, like when you're off daydreaming somewhere and suddenly, like, oh, yeah, I was talking to this client in front of me. Um, that choice of coming back into the moment. Um, so our attention is how we use that. We use our attention to decide what we want to focus on in any moment. Um, and I didn't have time to include this, but there's all kinds of different kinds of attention, right? There's focusing your attention. There's sustaining your attention. There's uh, divided attention, where I'm looking at a couple of different things. Um, most of us don't need more practice in divided attention, by the way, right? When you're driving here and drinking your coffee and texting and talking with your feet all at the same time. Um, but th this can actually uh, strengthen those areas of the brain. So the next part is on purpose. This is the conscious piece of what we're doing here. I'm going to choose what to pay attention to in any given moment instead of automatically falling into this old reaction pattern. Now, the next part is in the present moment. So what that means is choosing when I want to, to really notice what's right here in front of me right now. Uh, I'd be shocked if, if even in just the first few minutes of this presentation, somebody said, oh, yeah, I had no other thoughts about the past or the future while I was sitting here. I was just so into what you were saying, right? You're thinking, okay, boy, when is this going to be over? Or, um, you know, I wish I would have gotten a... a some more candy before I came here. I didn't know it was going to be so healthy. Or, you know, what, all these thoughts are <laughs> jumping all over the place, right? So you can just choose to notice, oh, I'm doing that. Let me come right back into uh, this moment. And there's a tray of donuts back there, by the way. Um, so choosing to come back, what the, what's the moment I'm in right now? Now that becomes crucial when you open up your planner, right? Um, even today, it's like, okay, I got this client, this client, oh, this client witnessed a murder. I've act, I, this is actually true. I, I'm working with this morning, and then I got to come here and present on mindfulness, and then I got to do this and this and this and this. When you look at your planner, you're looking at your whole day, right? And uh, it gets overwhelming. You get that stress response system. But remember that this is just another moment in the day, right? You're not going to see all those clients all at the same time. And even when you see this one client, you're not going to be able to deal with the whole hour all at once. You're only going to be in this moment. And then you're going to be with the next client in this moment, and this moment unfolds. So that bringing yourself back to what you're doing now actually helps you do it better. Because you're not thinking of all the other clients you have to serve. You get a better job doing the client, serving the client you're with right now. Um, not to say it's... Uh, bad to wander around in your mind, but when you're doing that compulsively, you're not going to be as focused and you're not going to get as much done on what's in front of you in the moment. Now, the next part is the hardest one for people, non-judgmentally. So what that means is choosing sometimes 
to let go of this compulsive need we had to make comparisons and judge everything, right? So even while you're sitting here, you might be thinking, oh, well, this speaker's okay, but he's not as good as the last one, or, well, I wish we had different chairs, or I wish this could have been done at a different time. Whether or not any of those are true, while you're having those thoughts, you're not in this moment quite as much. Right? You're thinking about these other comparisons. So if it's a compulsive thing, no matter what you're doing, Right? And we joke about people like that, right? You're, you're enjoying this beautiful sunset or whatever it is. Well, you know, the color of that sunset is really due to pollution in the atmosphere. You know? All these thoughts pull you out of what you're doing. You're not actually in that as much. Um, so it doesn't mean you throw judgments away, but sometimes to be able to choose to just set them aside for a moment and be more focused on what you're doing. Now, more insidious is all our self-judgments, right? Um, I can't do this right. Or, how am I ever going to do a good enough job on this? Or these things that start to creep in, especially when you're stressed, these sort of automatic thoughts and feelings we can have about ourselves. So learning just to notice those and set those aside a little bit more often. The last part, I, I, isn't always in the definition, but I like to include that because it's important to recognize this is an ongoing, um, unfolding, active process. Um, because mindfulness is actually considered a form of meditation. People hear that word and think it, all we do is kind of sit there and bliss out or something like that. This is about being very active and in the moment. So um, for me, one of the ultimate uh, models of this is when I was doing martial arts training. I just have to be in every single moment as it unfolds, right? If I'm thinking, okay, if he does this, I'm going to do that. <laughs> you know, I'm not in the moment, right? Oh, man, the next time I'm going to get hit in the face. I'm so embarrassed that I got hit in the face, <laughs> you know? You, you've really got to stay right in that moment, right? And, and you know that, whether, whatever your job is, while you're jumping all around to other times and places, you're not as focused on what you're doing. So to be able to be in this moment and then let go of that moment, because here's another moment, and to keep coming back to it fresh. So let's get down to the uh, uh, nitty gritty, because uh, I think this is important. Why, why does this work. People have been talking about this for a long time. Why is science now paying attention to it? Um, and I also like to emphasize this because not everybody uh, uh, speaks the language uh, that other people may understand or appreciate. So I've been to places where you're supposed to just sit there for a whole day and then you'll get what mindfulness is. And traditionally that's a practice um, that works for a lot of people. But I think for us, it's like, well, why, what am I supposed to be getting out of this? What's it for? What's it do? How's it work? Uh, when you can satisfy your thinking brain that way, you might uh, uh, be more willing to jump in and practice. So um, this would be the densest part. If, if, if you have a limited amount of uh, attentional capacity, uh, here's, here's where you want to draw it up. <laughs> you know. That's not to say you can slack the rest of the presentation, but this is the, here's, the, here's the meat of what I want to talk about. So what we most know about stress, anxiety, and all these different kinds of things is that avoidance works in, right in the moment, but it doesn't work long term. All right, so if I'm feeling stressed, I don't like the way I'm feeling. So if I can just think about something else, if I can watch uh, a movie, or if I can... Uh, just even run away from the thing that's causing me the stress. In that moment, it goes down a little bit, so my brain says, oh, do that. Avoiding helps uh, deal with stress. Uh, but the problem is, obviously, the stress doesn't permanently go away. When you come back to the situation or back to your life, it's still going to be there. So what we know of all the vague things you might think uh, psychology seems to be, what we know most scientifically is that to get through anxiety, you expose yourself to it. You step into it, it gets worse, and see, that's why your brain says, oh, this is worse, this is not working, you back away, and so that reinforces backing away, right? But if you just stay with it, it always levels off. There's no such thing as infinite energy. It always levels off. Your brain will tell you it's going to explode, but it won't. <laughs> it levels off, and then it comes back down without you doing anything. This is a crucial point. So. Uh, the analogy I like to use is a swimming pool. So if I jump into a cold swimming pool, right, you've all had that experience of, oh boy, this is cold, I'm supposed to be here to have fun, this is crazy, I'm getting out of here. Um, and then you're even colder, because now you're wet, the wind's probably blowing on you or whatever. What you know is that if I stay in the water, I feel a lot worse and I think this is no fun, but if I just stay, in fact, the more I let it happen instead of fight it the whole time, my body just adjusts. That's what bodies do, uh, whether it's stress, anxiety, cold, whatever it is. And um, 
it'll feel fine after a while, right? So the problem can be when you just keep jumping in and jumping out and jumping in and jumping out and, jump, and you just never get through. Um, so it's going to be crucial. Now it doesn't matter if you uh, are pushed in all at once, and actually that doesn't look like such a bad scenario, but uh, if you're pushed in all at once <laughs> into the cold swimming pool, right, and, and you feel it all at once and it passes, or you, you, some of you may be the ones that put your foot in one little toe at a time and then wait for your foot to adjust and you put the other foot in and wait for that to adjust and then you go up to your knee. It works as long as you stay in, if you keep going in and out. Um, so what does this have to do with mindfulness and stress? So it's the same concept. This is a funny, funny thing because all of us in this room use our thinking to help us earn a living and that, that's a good thing. We don't want to stop being thinking people, please. Um, but here's the thing that happens. I don't like the way I'm feeling in my body. I'm stressed, I'm anxious, whatever it is. So I think, because our thinking is what we use to fix problems, right? Thinking doesn't fix our feelings all that well. But what happens is while I'm thinking, I'm not feeling my body quite as much. I'm in my head. So because I'm not feeling the stress as much, my subjective experience of the stress goes down. Now your brain is literally wired to say, whatever just made that go down, keep doing it. So you can't stop thinking about the situation or you're just thinking all the time. Right? That's why alcohol is so addictive. Right? I take a drink I, and sure enough, in that moment, it does take my bad feeling down, uh, but then it comes right back and I gotta take more drinks to get, so same with thinking. If I stop thinking, it comes back up. Oh, it's getting worse, I better think some more. So you're, you get caught in this, in this trap. So here's the exposure therapy piece is just, wow, I'm thinking a lot about this client today. It must mean I'm stressed. Instead of trying to fix the thoughts, I'm just going to notice, wow, I'm thinking a lot about this. It must mean I'm stressed. So when you let yourself feel the stress in your body, it's going to get worse. Yes, yeah, I don't like the way I'm feeling. I better think some more. Is, that's one option. But if you just stay with it, what will happen is you'll feel the stress rise. And you just stay with it, and it'll pass. Now. Sometimes it may be 5, 10, 15 minutes, which feels like forever. Uh, but the more you practice that, the quicker it goes, the less high the level gets. And you just learn to flow through a little bit more. Or you just recognize, yeah, I'm stressed right now, but I'm in the middle of uh, this courtroom appearance, and I'm not going to deal with it right now. You can make that choice as long as it's not the one you always make. Um, so it's just that choice, more often, than just to notice. And you'll, you'll see that it'll pass uh, on its own. Um, now, the other thing that's happening that you're learning to do is um, relate to your thoughts differently. So, um, <laughs> I'm just asking this question knowing that everyone does this. Have you ever argued with yourself in your mind, right? Uh, there is a school of thought that actually works pretty well if, of challenge your thoughts. Oh, I can't do anything right. Well, what's the evidence that you can't do anything right? Well, look at all these things that I've failed at. Well, what about that one thing you did right? Well, that's because somebody helped me. You can literally, they're your own thoughts. You're not going to outthink yourself, right? But, so sometimes we can get caught up in this. So instead of fighting our own thoughts and outthinking ourselves, we just notice, wow, I'm thinking a lot right now. I'm arguing with myself right now. It must mean I'm stressed, anxious, sleep deprived, whatever it is. And then I deal with that. Or I just wait for it to rise and fall. Um, or I just decide, no, I, I, I need to take a break, I take a walk. You can do, choose to do something in that moment rather than just let it build and build and build and build over time. Um, now, it's, it's easy to get, well, relatively easy to get this intellectually, but it really takes some practice um, to be able to shift out of old habits because that's just what we do. I think when I don't feel right and I try to fix it with my thinking, it takes a little practice to start to re learn to relate to this differently. And when I talk about journaling, it doesn't mean like write out all your feelings. Um, when we do the groups, we just have people write down, uh, you know, as I, uh, when I was being recorded, um, <laughs> I was thinking about when I did this with a, uh, with a veteran at the VA hospital. I said, so what did you notice in your thoughts as you were doing this? This, this is just crap. I'm not getting anything out of this. I don't know why this is helpful. I don't see how this is going to help me. And, and by doing that, he was actually noticing what his thoughts were and realizing that he was angry, and then he felt the anger and it passed, and before you know it, he's saying, but actually, I've been playing a lot more happily with my kids, and I've noticed that I can appreciate what I'm doing a little bit more once he got that thought out um, from him. So journaling just means I'm just writing down 
uh, my thoughts is on one more way that I can see my thoughts on paper instead of uh, being inside my thoughts. So this is a very subtle thing. This decentering or diffusion means that I recognize I'm having a thought uh, that I can't do this right. That means I'm stressed versus I can't do this right as my sense of identity. That sounds like a funny thing. Uh, to recognize that we, that we have thoughts and we have feelings rather than letting them dictate all of our choices and behaviors. Okay, so you can go back to sleep now if, if you weren't paying attention before. Uh, so I'm often asked, what are some of the differences? Because you know, you hear this uh, mindfulness, oh, that's just like this and it's just like that. In some ways that's very true because this is very natural. We all, you know, kids can just notice all kinds of things and enjoy what they're doing in the moment. They're not too caught up yet in the realm of thoughts. Um, but there are also some important differences between some of these other methods that I think it's important to highlight. Um, one is um, what people often think of when they hear this word meditation, um, and that's something called absorption. Uh, there's a version called transcendental meditation. That's the one where somebody literally closes their eyes and goes off into this very blissful state. And actually it is it's very blissful. Um, and in fact, they've even run somebody under brain scanners that was in the state to say, what's, what's really going on here? What they discovered was in the parietal lobe, the part of your brain that um, tells you your relationship to where your body is, what's my body, what's not in my body. Um, one hemisphere says, this is my body, this is not my body, right? Babies don't quite have that figured out yet. They'll grab onto anything. Well, in this meditative state, those differences, the activity levels between those hemispheres sort of goes away. So can you imagine what that would feel like to not be able to literally to tell a difference between my own body and what's outside of my body? And the same thing happens with time. I don't have a sense of time anymore uh, in this particular state. So people interpret it as I feel one with the universe. It's kind of a, a literal subjective description. The problem with that though is even though it is healthful, it's restorative, it's rejuvenating, when you get out of that state and go back to the rest of the world, it's all still waiting for you. You haven't learned anything about your relationships or how to deal with uh, challenges, anything like that. Um, hypnosis is, uh, somebody asked me about this. Um, this is where you're induced into sort of a trance state so that you can get reprogramming to your subconscious brain, basically. Uh, but mindfulness is much more about conscious um, noticing. What are you actually doing right now, working with your conscious mind? Um, in a funny way, sometimes hypnosis can be used as another way of avoidance. I've literally had people come in, I'm, I'm so afraid of this kind of stuff, or I got so much stress, I want you to hypnotize me and make it all go away. All right, that's another way I'm going to use this to not feel what I'm feeling or not deal with something. Uh, it tends not to work very well. Now here's a very ironic thing. And this is probably what you thought you were coming here for if you didn't know anything about what to expect here. Relaxation methods, believe it or not, can actually make you feel more stressed. And I've, there's literally research on this, not for everyone, because it depends on how you use it. So why in the world would relaxation methods make you feel more stressed? Well, if you think about all the concepts we've been talking about, if I'm using that to avoid something, the, the something doesn't go away, and it's still there when I come back. So it's much like taking a vacation, right? Vacations are actually good, and I'm sure everyone in this room takes vacations all the time, maybe even leaving tomorrow for one, right? Um, what's the problem with vacations, though, right? You go off on your vacation, first of all, assuming that you can forget <laughs> work and not constantly be checking email while you're on vacation. Come back, all the work that you weren't doing while you're on vacation is piled up in addition to your usual work, and I have clients all the time that tell me, you know, I started feeling normal again, and then I came back to work, and all the stress, it, it's, it's, it's like a shock to my system. So vacations are, and relaxation methods are good for getting away, so to speak, and rejuvenating, but you can't rely on that as your only way of dealing with stress or dealing with the moment, right? So you're in the middle of this um, high conflict uh, discussion, all of a sudden, excuse me, I need to go off to the beach for a moment. You know, it's a, you, you're not going to be able to uh, do that. So you may, this is about moving into your experience, waiting for that uh, to come and go, and even to be okay with not feeling relaxed if that's not what the situation is in that moment. Just being with what's happening and not struggling with it and making it worse. What I find fascinating, even though I've 
do this and teach this all the time, is the actual measurements they can make on the human brain. So um, there's been a number of these out now, and I'm actually working with Children's Hospital doing this with kids right now, scanning their brains before and after doing one of these, uh, like the eight-week group in here. Just in eight weeks, uh, they can see literal structural changes in the brain, not just when they're doing it, but stronger brain circuitry around the areas that uh, I'll discuss on the next slide. It's, it's just stunning to me. Um, now, if, if you were to tell me, okay, what I want to do is measure your bicep, and then I'm going to have you exercise for eight weeks, and then I'm going to measure your bicep again, uh, of course we think, yeah, sure, that's going to be bigger. Um, it's, it's an odd thing to recognize. That, that happens in the brain, too. The more you work brain circuits, the stronger those circuits become from firing so much, the, the circuits rewire themselves. That's why habits are so hard to break, because uh, once you lay those uh, circuits down, uh, they build up, they become stronger. So um, here are the nine areas uh, that they've found associated with this part of the brain that builds up, that actually becomes thicker and stronger, so to speak, uh, after mindfulness practice. So um, body regulation, and a lot of that has to do with stress, right? I, I just the ability to uh, help myself relax when I need to or monitor my own uh, body functions. Attuned communication. This is where um, you have that ability to really connect with somebody. Um, now, uh, have you ever had the experience of being on the phone with somebody and you're talking with them and, and then all of a sudden, you're not even sure why, you just say, hello, are you there? Right? And they say, oh yeah, I'm here, I'm listening. You can just tell they were, must have been checking their emails or doing something else. You could just feel that the, the attunement wasn't there. Some people are like that. You don't really know if they're there <laughs> when you're talking with them, right? Versus other people that you really feel uh, that ability to connect with somebody. So this, this improves with this practice. Uh, emotional balance, because this part of the brain, and this is the prefrontal cortex, this place right in the front in the middle is where a lot of these changes happen among other places. Um, so the ability to regulate my own emotions. Response flexibility. This is a huge goal, is that um, despite how I'm feeling, maybe I am feeling stressed, but I still need to do this because it's important, um, versus my automatic reaction. Or, boy, I really love to say this right now, <laughs> but it may not be the best choice. I have more flexibility in how I respond. Uh, right? We were talking, Tabitha and I were talking earlier about just this, even I, this idea of waiting, right? The 24-hour rule with email, if, if it really gets you going, you better wait a 24 hours before you respond. So in mindfulness, you could say, uh, you know, 24 microsecond rule or 24 second rule or whatever. Just taking a moment, mm, here comes that feeling. <laughs> Not stuffing it down, but just noticing it that it's here. And then choosing, now what's the best response in this situation to make instead of what I might say that makes the situation worse automatically. Um, empathy, the ability to understand someone else's emotion, insight, knowing about yourself. Again, modulating emotions like fear. Intuition, this is a funny one to see on a scientific list about the brain, but not necessarily in a mystical sense. That means your ability to take in all the information, right? Um, even hunch may or may not be uh, uh, the right word to use, but sort of taking in all that besides just your thinking brain. You're just gathering all this information in your brain and you get a sense of what something's really about. Uh, and morality improves too. Um, my counsel advised me not to make a joke about morality in front of a group of lawyers, so I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> but morality can be improved as well. Um, now, I've done a lot of talking about it, and we haven't done it yet. So uh, if you're willing, let's just do this right now. It's nothing special. It's nothing weird. You can keep your eyes open, whatever you want to do. But I'd like to give you just a taste of something called the three-minute exercise. And as the name implies, um, it only takes three minutes. For that matter, you could do it in three breaths. But it's just a way of pausing for a moment and checking in with what things are going on right now. So um, the instructions are actually in your handout, so you don't have to worry about writing them down or memorizing them. So just right now, wherever you are, if you're willing, just, just take a moment, and you don't have to get into any kind of special pose. Uh, you can close your eyes if you find the sights distracting. I like to kind of look down in front of me, so uh, especially if I'm tired so my mind doesn't wander around. But all I want you to do right now is ask yourself, what am I experiencing in this moment? So I've been all kinds of places uh, talking about ideas and other times. And right now in this moment, what's your experience? 
And I like to further break that down into feeling my body. Just a quick check from your head to your toe. Are there any places that have tension or uncomfortable or feeling okay? Just check your body. And then emotionally, how are you doing right now? Are you feeling a little bored or irritated or neutral or happy? Just check in with your emotional state right now. And thoughts, can you tell what thoughts are coming and going right now in your mind? And then the second minute is just focusing on one thing as a way to sort of clear the slate, so to speak. So just focus on your breath for one minute. What I want you to do is just feel your own breathing. So feeling your stomach moving in and out, or feeling the air as it moves through your nose. And just whenever you notice your mind wandering, just notice that that's happened and just feel your breath again as best you can. And then for the third minute, expanding out from the breath to include your entire body. Can you feel your entire body? Sometimes we feel like a brain with this thing dangling underneath it. Can you feel yourself in your entire body all at once and just notice what's going on? And finally, whenever you're ready, just bringing your attention back to the rest of the room and allowing your eyes to open. You can move around if you need to. Uh, so you don't have to reveal anything personal, but what, what was your, ex anybody want to share something they noticed just, through, just in that quick exercise we just now did? Okay, so for you, you feel really relaxed right now. Okay. Okay, calming, okay. Anybody have the opposite experience? You're more uh, irritated or upset or, than you were before we started? Because I think that's really important to acknowledge because um, for that matter, once I did this with a room full of 100 psychologists, um, which was pretty fun to have them all quiet for that long. Um, <laughs> Uh, and one of them said, yeah, thanks a lot. I, I didn't realize how much my toe is hurting. Now my toe really hurts now that we did this exercise, right? But you know what? Your toe is probably hurting already. So now you know your toe is hurting. So you can loosen up your shoe. You can pop it or stretch it or do something with it. it had you not noticed, maybe by the end of the day, it really would have gotten inflamed and, and bothering you. So it's possible that when we stopped, you realized, Oh my gosh, I feel horrible right now. I was pushing myself so hard. I was distracting myself so much. I didn't realize how badly I am feeling in this moment. So in that moment, that's when that choice point opens up. I can choose to just continue to ignore it because I got something to do. Or I can choose to take a walk or do something for myself or slow things down, get more sleep. What you do with that is totally up to you. But just that ability to stop in the moment, even if it's a breath. I had a teacher once tell me, okay, your homework assignment is to breathe six times a day. And we looked at him like he's crazy, right? But his point was, if you can remember six times throughout the day, just stop and take a breath, you might be surprised that that little bit of a shift from the push, 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 go, go, go. Now, if you're an overachiever, you'll sit up in bed in the morning, <laughs> get your six breaths in and move on to the next thing, right? But the idea is uh, just that pause, just to be able to stop and notice for a moment. So uh, let me get through a couple more things, and we'll open up for questions. Um, first of all, I think it's important to recognize the obstacles to self-care. Um, you know, again, I often talk, and talk to psychologists and mental health professionals where even though our job is to help people take care of themselves, we're terrible at taking care of ourselves. Um, so just start to recognize what's getting in my way. You know, sometimes it's like as long as this list is done, as long as everybody else's needs are met, then maybe I'll do something for myself. So, um, or time, you know, but there's just no time for self-care, you know. But I've never once had someone say, you know, I don't have time to take showers. You know, I just, just, that's just 15 minutes a day I could be doing something else. Um, they just decide that's important. I mean, there's cultural differences, of course, but they decide it's important and they make time for it, but it's funny how often we put ourselves last on the, on the take care of, uh, of to-do list. Um, 
What's important too is, again, to bring it into your daily life, not to make this a special exercise that you do outside. So uh, between meetings, actually take a breath uh, instead of fumble around uh, and be thinking about uh, a ton of other things. Um, self as instrument means uh, the more I'm paying attention to myself, the more I can recognize, well, I'm getting a certain feeling about this person that I'm with, or uh, there's something going on here that's not being spoken of that I'm a little bit more aware of. Um, Self-monitoring, anybody notice muscle tension when, I, when we stop for that minute? So maybe you can't do anything about it, or maybe you could just stretch a little bit, versus you don't notice it and suddenly you have a headache, suddenly, but really the tension was probably building in your body all day long, but you weren't noticing it coming up. And again, just the ability to stop and take a breath. I worked with somebody once, uh, actually a psychologist, who said, I, I can't do this three minutes. I'm afraid, you know, I got so much to do, I'm afraid if I stop for three minutes, I'm just going to go, oh, blah. You know, and now I've got all my motivations gone. I'm not going to get anything done. I'm not going to feel like doing anything, right? Uh, that's our fear, right? If we, if we stop, that that's what will happen. So, of course, what I said was, eh, just try it out and see what happens. Just experiment for yourself. And as I was mentioning earlier, what happened is she actually did better work. Not that that's necessarily the goal of mindfulness, but the side effect was better work because she was doing what she was doing. So while I'm uh, writing this report, I'm not thinking of the 10 other ones I have to write. While I'm working with this student, I'm not thinking of the 20 other students I'm supposed to be talking to right now. And so you get the thing you're doing done much more efficiently uh, and then have a little more time and put the, uh, more of those breaks in there for yourself. Uh, so again, just throughout the day, noticing these things as they're coming up. And instead of fighting with your thoughts, oh, how interesting, I'm thinking about this again. Uh, you could choose, no, this is a really important case. I want to sit with this and really think about this. Or you can just realize, no, I'm just ruminating. I'm not, you know, thinking about this is not changing. I'm just going to go back to what I was doing and let that go. So you can have that choice. So again, just asking yourself, what am I doing right now? Uh, especially when you find yourself feeling really stressed. It's probably because you're thinking of 20 other things all at the same time. So what's right in front of me? What do I need to do right now? And it's okay, you know, keep lists or prior, you know, calendars or whatever so you don't forget, but um, usually thinking about them constantly all day long doesn't help you remember them any better because it makes you more stressed and that interferes with memory. So it's a funny cycle we get caught in. All right, so there's a few uh, uh, readings in there. The thing I wanted to highlight at the bottom is the mindfullawyer.com uh, has a lot of resources more specific uh, to some of the things that may be of interest to you. Um, so. And there's some contact, as mentioned. I do have a couple of groups um, going on. And I find there's just something about um, being with a group of other people going through it all at the same time, having that, uh, much like having an exercise partner, I suppose, where you're sort of all going through that process together to uh, uh, give your mind enough time to build those connections. Um, and they're not run as therapy groups in the sense of bear your soul or anything. It's really more of a skill building type of a group. So that's really, I think, the material I had uh, that I wanted to make sure we got to. And sure enough, we got like 10 minutes left. So uh, if there are questions or challenges or complaints, or, um, and since we are recording, we might want to run the mic around or, or I can repeat the question. Well, I really appreciate your in insight into this today. I, I've been practicing mindfulness and other forms of meditation for about five, six years now. And I've, I, I noticed one area that you didn't get into with um, on the obstacles to self-care and one's fear of losing your edge. I mm -hmm. think for attorneys, that's, that's a big issue. I know that you know, right. by being more mindful, you have more empathy, more compassion. How's that going to make me feel when I need to kick somebody's butt in a courtroom or yes. something? And, I, and I, I haven't found any kind of problem with that. I just yeah. I think the mindfulness brings me more aware of what's going on. Um, I also like to use the mindfulness, the, just the breath technique in meetings because I think I feel a lot better as a listener. I'm listening and kind of feeling how the person's talking, where they're coming from, and I think that really brings, allows me to have a better response as opposed to, you know, not listening to them, formulating my response to an answer or right, to a question right. and kind of missing an opportunity to connect with them on, from where they were coming from. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm all for the, the mindfulness, I think, is a very valuable part um, of my profession now mm -hmm. that, since I've been using it. So I'd encourage everybody to, to look into it further. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought that point up because sometimes people think, oh, this means we'll just walk through life like this. Sometimes there's teachers that talk really slow like that. 
you can absolutely mindfully kick somebody's butt. <laughs> Um, you know, there's times when you just need to turn it on and you just need to do what you got to do. It's not like, oh, that's bad. The question is, is that getting you what you want or are you always doing that as your hammer and you don't have any other tools? Um, because if you do that all the time, you're going to alienate everybody. They're not going to listen when you really do need to turn it on. Um, you need to do it in a calculated, uh, that sounds kind of negative, doesn't it? Uh, in a very conscious way of why you're doing what you're doing and what you want the result to be. But absolutely, it does not mean that uh, you'll just sort of, uh, you know, crumble into a goo. Yeah. Okay, if I didn't scare everybody, are there any more questions? <laughs> yeah. you, you talked about uh, vacations and mm -hmm. sometimes those result in more stress, whatever. The... Uh, thing that we often deal with is is that we're we're committed to working and getting things done and I think that that uh, all of us probably are taking at least one day off a weekend mm -hmm. but maybe two um, what do you recommend that somebody does on their day off I mean I've, I've heard it said that that you should relax your mind completely and not even be involved in pleasure reading or doing anything like uh, um, Sudoku or, or mm -hmm. anything else that taxes your mind that you it, it's good to give your mind a complete day off do you, do you would you like to comment on that yeah no that's a great question so yeah so you finally get that day off what, what do you do with it and honestly the answer is it totally depends on the person um, so for some of us we're just so wiped out yeah I don't even want to read a book I'm just I just literally want to be a vegetable today I want to watch TV or whatever and and that's that's fine other people um, are stimulated or find enjoyment of really getting out and gardening. I mean, to me, gardening, oh, that would be so much work to do. But for other people, <laughs> right, those weeds just keep coming back. Uh, you know, for other people, getting in the dirt and the ground is, is good for them. So really the question is, are, what are you consciously choosing to do on your time off? Because I know a lot of people that time off, that means I can fill it with appointments or I can fill it with doing this other stuff that I didn't have time to do at the office or... And, you know, that, that's a trade-off, right? Because when you get that work done on your day off, in that moment, oh, good, that's one less thing I have to worry about. But as we know, it's never all done, right? So can you also make sure you're not automatically, compulsively doing these other things? So the question is really, um, as far as mindfulness can help, is to just, okay, here I am on this day off. I might not even plan what my day off is. Maybe I, maybe I do, maybe I don't. But what, what do I feel like? would be best for me in this particular moment. So um, it could be taking a walk or something active. It could be absolutely nothing. Um, and, and by the way, mindfulness never, it's not the thing like it has a capital M and says you must do this or that. It's just one more tool. So all these other things, vacations are, are great. It's just if that's the only tool you have, you limit yourself. So it's really just asking yourself, what do I need on this day off? That's a good question. I don't know, I kind of missed this part. Um, I didn't quite understand it, maybe you can go over it. This whole idea of avoidance, mm -hmm. you know, under how does it work, avoidance makes feelings worse. Uh -huh. Could you just go over through that again, and, and was your example about the hurting toe sort of, a, uh, sort of an example of that? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, I, I should, I should uh, put the broader context here. It's really hard to, to figure out what I need to say in such a short amount of time. Um, so yeah, avoidance does work, and we're not saying never avoid everything, uh, you know, not to jump into everything uncomfortable. The problem with avoidance, uh, let's say chronic pain, for instance. Um, it hurts horribly, you don't want to feel it. Um, so I spend tons of energy and time not feeling my pain. So what happens is I'm, I'm resisting it, and then my muscles tense up around the pain spot, and I actually inadvertently make it worse than it already is. So I could choose to actually notice it sometimes, move into it, and what you'll find is it's not a solid block. It, it sort of waxes and wanes, it's sharp and dull, and then your resistance to it loosens up. And this may sound funny, but you can just feel the pain without adding on all the suffering on top of that. So emotionally, you know, I just don't want to deal with this person because they really bother me, so I'm just never going to be around them. Um, it's certainly a choice you can make, but what often happens is it festers over time. Um, so what I'm talking about more is a long-term pattern that leads to really high levels of anxiety and stress more than, you know, uh, certainly sometimes you just, yeah, this isn't worth it, I'm walking away from this. But 
if you're always avoiding, then it's sort of hanging there in the back of your mind, so to speak, um, and, and it can make, make it worse. Yeah, yeah, right, especially the ones that repeat themselves. Those, those, yeah, maybe that's a better way to say it. When you're caught in a vicious circle of things like that, um, the, where you struggle more and more and more and it's getting worse and worse and worse, usually it's because you're trying not to deal with it. Yeah. I'm going to build a little on what Gary said. Just, I um, had a trial about two years ago and it was in bankruptcy court, and it was my first trial in bankruptcy court. And um, it was in front of Judge Hopkins, and I, I don't know if anyone's had that experience, but Judge Hopkins knows more about bankruptcy than, uh, you know, all the practitioners in the greater Cincinnati area combined, probably. And so um, the other attorney just came to me over the lunch hour, and I was in a conference room getting ready for the afternoon, and, and he got really aggressive, and he got into my face, and I basically, told him to push off in a not so nice way. Uh, and I remember distinctively my, the paralegal that I have now who was helping me with this trial, she said just, you know, let it go, let it go. And when I went back in the courtroom, I took these three deep breaths and just let all of that go. And I ended up winning the case because I was mindful of how angry I was and able to let that anger go. And my actual question to you is, I know that there are a lot of literature about using certain um, sounds. For instance, your telephone ringing to remind mm -hmm. you to take a breath in your office. And could you tell um, the audience more about how you could integrate um, just simple, you know, three breaths when you get aggravated or you get an email from someone that you're like, oh, not again, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How you can do that in your office on a daily basis because mindfulness is not just about meditation. It's about actually um, can be integrated throughout your day. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Even just remembering, I, I know we've got to wrap up out of respect for everyone's time. Um, those little reminders, the hardest part is just to remember to do it. It's easy enough just to ask yourself how you're doing in any moment, but we get so enmeshed in what we're, so caught up. It's like we're watching a movie and you forget it's a movie kind of experience all day long. Um, yeah, so there's all kinds of ways that you, can, might, uh, you might be able to do this for yourself. One is actually by practicing it at set times, it's more available to you when you do need it. Um, but otherwise, there's all kinds of things. You know, you can put up a picture in your office or, um, you know, whatever works for you. I actually had a student once say that there's a mindfulness app, mindfulness bell app. You, oh, you've got it. And apparently, it, every just so often and very randomly, just very soft, gong. And, and you hear that, and it's like, oh, yeah, take a breath. What was funny to me, yeah. Well, what was hilarious to me is a student said, I find myself waiting and saying, I hope it goes off. I'm like, you know, you could go ahead and do it anyway. You don't have to wait for the bell to go off. But that's a good point just of uh, integrating it. And suddenly, uh, you know, in your phone, instead of, sending a, a, a flood of chemicals, you, you, oh, as soon as I feel that, that's a reminder to take a breath. That's the hardest part is to use your negative feelings that come up or stress itself as the reminder that you need it. That's what takes some of the practice there. So good question. Well, thanks everyone for your time and attention. I'll be around a little bit if you have any more questions.